Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Fine Woodworking's bi-weekly podcast. I'm here with Fine Woodworking's Mike Pekovich. Hey, guys. Jeff Rose. Hello. And I am your host, Ben Strano. Today, we're joined by the director of the Connecticut Valley School of Woodworking, Bob Van Dyke. Can you make any more noise over there, Bob? I can try. All right. I just, I'm still wondering, though, why it's called Shop Talk Live when we're recording it. And it's highly edited. And that, too. <laughs> so that just... <laughs> got edited out (laughs) oh you'll be surprised at things i can make Uh, you say i'm sure (laughs) (laughs) thanks all right if you have any questions you'd like us answer on the show send them into shop talk at taught.com any links or articles we mention will be on this episode's show notes page which can be found at shoptalklive.com if you're watching on youtube please click that thumbs up button and I am about to make a little extra room in my garage or in my shop. What's up? What, maybe like two years ago, Bob did an article. <laughs> <laughs> At least two years ago. It was, uh, it was in, ep- or not episode 254, it was in issue 254. And you did a sharpening box, right? Yeah, did a couple of them. And, yeah. and one of those sharpening boxes somehow made it into my cubicle. I think mm. by you, and you said, Bob said, give this away. Huh. I don't know why I didn't keep it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said it doesn't work anymore. Anyway. <laughs> so it sat in my cubicle for a while, and then we brought it up to your shop, and we did a video about giving it away. Something, yeah. And then it went back into my shop, and I've moved it around like 2,800 times, and I trip over and go, stupid. Okay. And At, Rather than just like using it. Well, I wanted to use it, yeah. but I felt like that would kind of be stealing it because yeah. it was meant for giving away to the fine readers of fine, of fine oh, woodworking. Exactly. So we are finally doing this. We're doing it. All right. So. I don't even know what it looks like. It's right there. <laughs> Not oh, that yeah. one though. Oh yeah, it's not no, quite that one. So that's the one that I use every day. It's almost, almost just like yep. that one. But <clears throat> if you want a chance to win a cover piece from that's Fine it. Woodworking, that's <laughs> this it. chance does not come up very often. Leave a comment in the show notes page uh, of this episode, and not only are you going to do that, you have to leave a comment and you have to go to what's your website. Schoolofwoodworking.com. Go to schoolofwoodworking.com and sign up for Bob's email list. On the left-hand side, I think there's a uh, thing to sign up. So if you go do both of those things, we're going to enter you to win the uh, cover piece from issue 254, Bob's Stone Go Sharpening Box. Yeah. Yeah. And if you sign up on the school website, you're guaranteed to get at least... Three, but probably no more than five emails from me a year, because that's about how many I do. You're not real consistent, we'll say. <laughs> yeah. Oh, open house is coming up. Oh, there's not enough people in this class. Okay, I'll maybe I'll get around to doing a, yeah. doing an email. Nah, that didn't happen. Bob's marketing department is working tirelessly <laughs> up in Manchester, Connecticut. Um. All right. Let's uh, let's just go straight into the questions. I had a discussion marked out, but we went long last time, so here we go. All right, this question's from a uh, friend of the show, Amy Costello. I have been using, and it's a stropping question, and finally there's a stropping person All right. on the show. Instead of strapping. Stra- <laughs> <laughs> I'm All not right. going to go there. I've been using a piece of vegetable tanned leather with green waxy honing compound as a strop. I start by rubbing compound onto the shiny side of the leather. However, when I go to strop my carving knives, the pressure from the, my blade compresses the compound and it flakes off. Is there something wrong with my compound or am I doing something wrong? Um, the answer, you know, it's funny because I've seen that happen. Um, stropping is one of those things that uh, gets people going, um, like like in sharpening, uh, on any sharpening discussion. But then you get the people go, oh, my God, how could you strop something? Um, that would be me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I, 
you know, stuff that I learned, uh, you know, years ago uh, from early fine woodworking magazines, probably. Um, well, there you go. There you go. That was all wrong. <laughs> yes. um, no, but it's stropping is one of those things. You either do it or not. And it's true. I do it sometimes. I don't always. And it's something I learned. I learned from Phil Lowe, Will Neptune. That's where I kind of go, well, yeah, these people that say you can't strop, uh, those good two guys know what they're talking about. I think of stropping in terms yeah. of carving tools more than edge tools like chisels and planes. I think it's, I think stropping carving tools is, I think that's par for the course. I think yeah. probably everybody does that. Uh, pretty much, but um, stropping uh, regular edge tools, bench tool, bench tools, call them that. Um, I don't have a problem with it. The idea that, oh, you're dubbing the edge over. Yes, which you are. Um, what you're actually doing, it, you know, like <laughs> basically you can't dub it over so much that, uh, you know, um, you're going to ruin, ruin it because you, ha you have to go back and resharpen. Let's, re anyway. let's rephrase that. You don't dub it over enough to where you ruin it, but I've seen the, the, the biggest problem I've seen with stropping. Um, yeah. And I, you know, you are, I think you are rounding over a small, anywhere from a really small amount to a fair amount. And I think you especially get in trouble if your technique is not great on the back of say a chisel, which mm -hmm. has to be dead flat to work. Yeah. If you put any round over at that front edge, Oh, and it, the back bevel, yeah. Yeah it, yeah, it doesn't function the way it's supposed to function. But what happens, yeah, I mean, you can't do that instead of sharpening or in place of sharpening. Right. I mean, a strop is great because a strop takes you from um, really sharp to screaming sharp. And it's very small difference, but it's a noticeable difference. Um, will... Neptune talks about, I mean, I learned from him what his take on it was that when you're sharpening something, it doesn't matter what the grit is, you're still going to have little microscopic scratches. There's a little bit of a give in the leather strop. And that little bit of give is actually sharpening, is actually shining the surface of the scratch, if you can picture that. You've got this scratch, call it a V, mm -hmm. okay? And But that V is a little bit rough, and that little, little bit of honing compound is bringing that surface up a little bit shinier. Um, okay, um, maybe, you know, maybe maybe that's that's right. I, I, I don't know the science behind it, but it, it makes sense. Um, but what I do see is that there is a little bit of a difference and when what I do, what I do usually is if I'm sharpening uh, and I'm using a honing guide um, and I'm doing a chisel or a plain iron, the last thing I do is while it's still in the honing guide, I'll take two or three passes on the strop because you're at exactly the right angle. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. If you're if you're at the wrong angle, and that's when people, you know, you're at too high of an angle and you're dubbing the edge over. That's when you're screwing yeah. stuff up. Do you hit the back with the strop as well? I'll pull it straight back. And just keep it dead flat. Oh, and my left hand is on top of the chisel or the iron pushing down. Right. So, yeah, you have to be doing that. Yeah, for sure. Are you pulling yeah. the burr off on your stone or on your strop? I do it on the stone. Okay. Yeah, I do it on on the on my my whatever my finest stone is. Okay. You know, so the the burr is gone. So you're not going to oh, yeah. be gouging your your strop then. No. Okay. So, Mike, you did a really good job not screaming during that no, strop talk. Whatever gets you there. Okay. Good. The thing for me, I recommend against it because. Um, you are sort of, you're messing up the geometry of that blade to the point where you might have some short-term benefits for honing, but once that edge starts to get dubbed over, you have to remove more material once you do go back to sharpening. Um, and I just think it's like, it's, it has long-term consequences if you're heavy-handed about it. 
If you're having, that's yeah. the thing. <clears throat> if you rely on that rather than if you rely on that to resharpen things rather than just resharpen. I mean, right. I I like hardly ever like a like a plain iron. I wouldn't even consider taking it. You know, restropping that. You know, while I'm using it, I if you're pulling go. it out, you're going to your stone. Yeah, of course, and, okay. of course. And yeah. the same, even with a chisel, I mean, I'll I'll like once in a while, I might hit it while I'm working with it, mm -hmm. but I'll do it as a last step in the sharpening process, much more than you know, intermediate or in between while I'm working with mm -hmm. it. Right. Whereas with carving, that's what you're doing with a strop. Lots of times you're, you're hitting, hitting it, hitting it while directly. you're working. You're yeah. refreshing that edge a little bit. And that's the difference. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so... I strop my sandpaper. <laughs> <laughs> it just gives it that extra little do you, do you sharpness. Keep the, do you keep the... Which side is up? Because that's a big thing. Do you have the... The, the suede side? The or? suede side of the sandpaper? Well, the suede... <laughs> suede gets, side of the sandpaper. <laughs> what, what the suede does is it gets between the grits and it polishes the sides of the grits. <laughs> Well, that's everyone knows that. Oh. <laughs> so, what about Amy's question about yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. Was that something, Sorry, Amy. something about you don't use the green stuff. Question what do you number use? Uh, yeah. I it's the white. You stuff use you white use. stone. No, I use the yellow uh, stone. Yellowstone. I use herbs. Yellowstone. Okay. I thought it was herbs. Yellowstone. Herb. herb. <laughs> well, and I always wanted to, you know, because a yellowstone. Um, you know, that's what I that's what I've used, but it's actually pink. And his phone number used to be on the package. Herb's Herb Dunkel, I think his last name was, was on the package. And I always wanted to call him up and say, Why is it Yellowstone if it's pink? But then I heard that he passed away, so it's another opportunity lost. <laughs> But I was looking last night online because I wanted to find out more information about this question. And it's amazing how much stuff there is online about, uh, home, about you know, um, stropping. stropping and compounds and all. And I actually printed out this whole sheet of all of the different ones. I've seen that one. And I left it on my desk. I meant to bring it. <laughs> but it turns out that Herb Dunkel's son has a honing compound also that is blue. So I don't know. That's huh. I have to find out a little bit more okay, about yeah. it. Yeah, and use a piece of like horse hide or something. I use um, horse butt leather. Yep. And horse butt leather is the hardest no stretch. And it's the leather that goes along the spine of a horse. Uh, and it's really... Um, you know, there's no stretch. You can pull, pull, try and pull it and it doesn't do anything. And so you're going to get less, much less compression, much less dubbing mm -hmm. with that. Uh, it's one of those details I'm not going to worry about. If I didn't have any horse butt leather, oh, my God, I can't use it. No, I got a whole box full of leather that, you know. I don't know, man, because I, I bought, <clears throat> I bought, like, I think it was Trend sells a little piece of you know eight by three leather. Uh -huh. It was kind of expensive for yeah. a little piece of eight by three Ridiculous. leather, but it was it was horse butt, and um, that was at home or at the workshop or something like that. And then in the other one, I had just gone to Tandy and I bought you know a quarter of a hide or something for mm -hmm. lots of stuff because that's what you do. Yeah. And uh, I started using that as a strop, and it was just some random leather. And it was way too soft, and it was dubbing instantly, almost. Interesting. I wonder if it was really thick. If that makes yeah, a difference. Yeah, it was. It was thicker and, yeah. and soft. So yeah. I would definitely, you know, if I was going to go out and buy more leather for stropping, I, I think I would, I'd search out. The horse butt leather yeah. is definitely better. I mean, let's let's but... be honest. It's it's like a ten dollar expense compared to. A five dollar expense. Yeah, so. I mean it's it's not you know I mean I look at that kind of thing and go yeah you know how much money I spend in Starbucks every week, you know a difference is like so what um, tens of dollars. Yeah, you know it's but but I think the it all works. 
you know, uh, and we're really talking minute details here, mm -hmm. minute differences. The does can you strop? Can you not strop? You know that right. whole argument. Uh, it's like pins first, tails yeah, first. Absolutely. It all works. Yeah. It all works. You know, so it's really kind of what you what you want to do, what you feel good about. And then stropping, stropping's country cousin is the diamond paste on a piece of MDF for which wood. Is a, which is a type, uh, which is a type of strop. Right. Yeah, and and it's in the list. Uh, it was, I was looking cousin. last night. It was in the list of strops. Yeah. And it was funny because I was like, wow, I haven't used that stuff in years, but that's awesome. That's, you know, that's that what I use. One micron, half micron. Uh, I used to do it on MDF, and then I started doing it on a piece of hard maple, just mm -hmm. plain a piece of hard maple with a hand plane, so you know, perfect shaving, and then uh, charge it with the diamond paste. It's awesome. Mm. Yeah, works really well. So we still have an answer we still to have question. And, no. and, and I've been looking, and I was looking for... Um, oh, that's a better picture than what you sent me. Same picture. Uh, yeah. Um, I've seen that on my own straps a couple of times where I've done that. And I, I don't know if it's the compound or the leather. Now, I checked around, and that's why I was looking online, because I wanted to see, is there something about this? Because this has happened to me, too. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things I just kind of shrug my shoulders and say, yeah, whatever. Um, and I talked to Mary May uh, about it also because I know that she, is, she uses a strop. And I said, Do you, you know, have you seen this? And she said, no, nah, I really haven't seen it. But um, both of our take on it was maybe it's just putting too much on it. Huh. You only need a little, little bit. And this looks pretty, it's like thick enough to yeah. where when it chips yeah. off, it, there's a definite thickness to yeah. it. Yeah. And I've seen that happen. Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. I've done it, you know, so it might just be that there's too much goop on it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I wonder about is, because I, I looked online, I was talking about putting a little bit of oil mm. on the back of the leather. Not on the front. What? On the suede and side of the leather. On the suede side of the leather, it was talking about putting oil on the back of it, and then it would it was a couple days process because you put a little bit of oil on the back, and then you come back and you put a little bit more on, and when it finally starts to just seep through the front face, stop. So it was basically saturating the yeah. leather without getting it all over the the front. And I'm like, that's something I might try just to just to yeah. further my knowledge and see about it because uh, that 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 made a little bit of sense. And Mary said that she had a, a strop that was a powder that she put a little bit of oil on the leather just to keep it stuck down, mm -hmm. and it worked. So that kind of makes sense too. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I don't think it's the defective. Um, honing compound. I don't, I don't think that's it, but my, it could be because it comes from all over the place, that, stain, that green stuff. My only yeah. question is, looking at the picture on the big screen here, there's a little bit more grain to this leather yeah. than you see on horse butt normally. So I'm wondering if this is a piece of leather that might have Either flexible or maybe it's stretching or you think it could be treated somehow it might yeah. Huh. yeah i wonder i wonder about that i was wondering about the vegetable tanned uh if that was an issue because what's the other one chromium tanned or something like that chrome tanned i think Got they me. just use like entrails right i don't know like it's like true tanning that's like nasty <laughs> oh god yeah yeah but there's another there's another uh another process of tanning uh, and I don't know enough about it. I've, mm. I've heard, I've heard it, but I don't know anything about it. Hmm. Well, Amy, yeah. sorry, that was of no use whatsoever. Didn't, didn't really. <laughs> She's we, like listening to the. Okay, get they're going to get through it. Get it's get coming! It's coming! Try, they even got Bob on it. <laughs> try getting a different piece of leather. Yeah. Sorry, Amy. Keep trying. Let us know what works for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's too bad. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Question number two, and this one's from Matt. I have some 10 inch wide, eight quarter African mahogany that I have been resawing into thinner boards. 
I start by jointing one face, then one edge, and then resawing, usually down the middle. There's a good amount of tension in the board, so after resawing, they have a decent twist. Do I need to let the boards reacclimate before I rejoint them and plane them, or can I do that immediately? Also, would I be better off not jointing the face and resawing to a center line rather than using the bandsaw fence? It seems like a waste of time getting that face flat just so that I could use the bandsaw fence. So let's answer the first part. Resaw, twist, let it sit, or just go for it? Definitely let it sit. I mean, and you were about to say, just go for it. If you're about, if you're, if you, you know, you're taking a piece of wood, an eight quarter piece of wood, and let's say you're resawing it in half, and it was flat and square, and you just completely changed the equilibrium, everything in that board. Right. You just completely, completely changed it. Uh, cut all the fibers, that sort of thing, all those tensions. Um, if you just ignore it and just start flat, you know, plane it to, then it's kind of like, well, yeah, it's going to be twisted. Uh, if you let it sit around for a few days or a week, if you can, and reflatten it and thickness plane it, then it's going to be and stay a lot flatter. Unless you are so thin that trying to flatten that was a waste of time anyway. Right. Because sometimes trying trying to flatten a piece of three eighths inch thick. Right. Eh, that's not gonna happen. Right. No. Um yeah, I guess it, it depends on the type of resawing and the type of sort of warping you're getting. Normally if the pieces sort of vertically cup towards each other and then along the length they cup towards each other as well. That in a, in a case to me that there was sort of a rushed uh, kiln drying process and so the outside of the board is basically case hardened and that there's a lot of tension built up on the outside. But when both sides are case hardened, that's fine. But when you rip it down the center, um, that's when it, it really sort of takes off. So I don't think any amount of setting is going to allow that board to straighten back up because I think it's just built into the board through the drying process. So what I like to do is at least flatten that outside face, which is the cupped one, which is weird. You don't think of putting that cup face on the joiner, but by um, planing that outside face uh, with the push pad right in the center along the length of the board, so the front tip and rear tip are elevated until it gets flat, it does two things. You're removing a lot of that case hardened stock from the outside. And also, as you're doing that, the board tends to correct itself flat. Um, it tends to decup so that um, you're actually, by the time you have the outside flat, the inside face a lot of times is cupped um, not nearly as much as it was before that. So, I mean, that's why I think So it's, this is immediately after resawing? Then? Yeah, so after okay. resawing, I'll do that. But then it's, And the cup is up. On yes. the joiner. Right. The cup is Which up. is opposite from how you would normally do it. Right. Because what happens uh -huh. if the cup is down or that inside face is down, yeah. as you keep removing material from the inside face, that outside case hardened face is going to want to cut more and more yeah. toward the yeah. center and Makes it just never gets there. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think boards do need to sort of relax over time and they kind of do their thing. So resting is good. But at the same time, if there's a lot of internal tensions, I think you need to try to correct that as much as possible. That case hardening thing, we, we, we were talking about that a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And it's been on my list to to play with, to try it. As Mike was talking about that, uh, the case hardening on the outside and then resawing basically taking like if you took it in three so you have something in the middle of the board in the middle of the eight quarter board um and his point there was because there's no case hardening on either face right you take that out and it just it comes out and it just stays dead flat right so and it's one of those i've wanted to try that just to see for myself because it makes complete total sense okay so the inner the the, the inner third yeah has no case hardening. Right. So that's going to stay flat. Right. And then the outer faces are case hardened. Yeah, they'll both cup so they towards the center. Yeah. yeah, and which they do. They always cup towards the center. Yeah. They, don't, they don't go the other way. Right. Yeah. Huh. 
Yeah. Okay. So so when you're dealing with Case Harden Wood, sure sign is that it's it's cup towards the center. Um, but what if perfectly dried wood? I could see anything having some sort of a twist to it. If there's no cupping and just a huh. twist, yeah. After you you resaw, what's the problem there? It's if it's not case hardening. Well, there you've got you you think of a think of this board or a tree, and think of these fibers that are f- f- like full length under tension, and you. And you just cut those fibers when it became a board. So now the tensions are completely changed within that board. So it's going to move. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like releasing the strings, you know. And then if you cut it again, um, you know, gonna they're going to change again. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, how I, that's how I visualize it, yeah. you know. Do you ever resaw and it's just flat? Yes. Air dried stock. Yeah. It's just like butter. It just falls off and it's dead flat. Yeah, you've been telling me that. And I just, I hate it because I don't have any yeah. air dried stock <laughs> to, to play. It's <laughs> like, damn. <laughs> so, yeah, and that bites me in the butt because I'll do these boxes. My technique I'll talk about later kind of utilizes this where I need really, really thin um, pieces, typically of, say, of walnut. I'll, I'll make a mitered liner to fit inside of a case, and, and that liner is often like 3 sixteenths thick. And so I'll get a piece of air-dried 8 quarter walnut, and I'm just like taking these just wafer-thin slices off, yeah. off, and they just stay flat. So, um, And then I say, Bob, okay, now I need a bunch of liner stock 3 sixteenths. And he's like, are you talking about? <laughs> so he goes, do you know I have to start with like four quarter stock to get like two pieces of three sixteenths? <laughs> and, and so it's, yeah, it's a different thing. Yeah. Um, you do, you do probably more milling than anyone we know because you're preparing. You mean for the school? Yeah. Yeah. W- well, it depends on the class, you know, I mean, in, if you're doing a, like a week long class making a piece of furniture. Um, and if you start off with just here's the stock, roughs, roughs on stock, there's no way you're going to be finished or even close to finished by the end of the week in yeah. five days. The other thing is um, most of the time we're pre milling stuff and pre mill it, sticker it. And then finish mill it, uh, and then start dimensioning it. You know, and that takes that pre milling. Ideally, you're, it's sitting there for a week in stickers. You know, I mean, realistically, it doesn't always happen, but you know, and like when we did the shape and high chest class, those we did seventeen of those things, um, and we it was all five quarter wide, five quarter cherry. And we pre-milled everything. We did three three millings on mm. every stick of, of, of wood. How far did you take that down? What was the final thickness? Uh, Seven-eighths. Right. So you're going from inch and a quarter down to seven-eighths. In and you're, three passes. Yeah. And you're taking times. stock off each face. So okay. it isn't this whole resawing equilibrium thing. But just as you're removing material, yeah. it changes those stresses yeah. and mm-hmm. it's going to move a little bit. Which And, and the stickering, um, you know, that's... It's important. It's really important. And what, what you do is you have, you know, you resaw it, you sticker it, and basically you put a straight edge across it. And, you know, a couple days, you know, two days later, you put a straight edge across the cup. And let's say it's a, you know, 32nd of an inch. And you come across, you come in the next day and you check it again. And it's a little bit more than a 32nd. And then you come again and it's like a 16th. And then the next day you check it and it's still a 16th. Well, when it stops okay. changing, then it's done. Huh. Okay. You know, and then ideally that's what you're doing. When you move on. Yeah. yeah. And then, but then, but then. And if there's more. Of course. Um, and I see that I was thinking about this, and I think like, it's probably not going to come up, but I, but I'm going to throw it in anyway. I see all the time these um, people that are taking finished parts, finished parts that they have. Maybe they haven't cut the joints yet, but they're all finished, dimension and everything, and they're stickered 
on the bench stickered and the whole project stickered. And you go, who would do that? Why would, why are you doing that? And my question is always, why are you doing that? Oh, it's to let it, you know, breathe and stuff. You look at a piece of wood and what's the idea? What's the purpose of stickering? To let air pass over all sides equally. For what reason? To let it so, move. Yeah. To let it, to let it move, to let it warp if it's going to. And the idea is now's the time to do that. So, and that's all great if you haven't done any finish milling. If, but once it's done and it's going to become a furniture part, what's the last thing you want it to do? Move. Exactly. Yeah. So the last thing you want to do is sticker it. Yeah. You seal it instead. You so stack it and wrap it. I've I've been stickering it and wrapping it. Stickering it and <laughs> wrapping it? The worst of all <laughs> worlds. <laughs> well, Belt button no, suspender, it's, man. It's, <laughs> <laughs> completely opposite. So, so each, like, you know? like stickering it and then taking cellophane yeah. and wrapping Making the crap sure out that, of it. That, yeah, so that, <clears throat> uh, that's okay. <laughs> Well, actually, we talked about this a couple of yeah. podcasts back because I was saying how I would stick her through the entire process. Uh -huh. And because of you're doing no, you're sort of stacking flat and then yeah. covering the top of it, even just weighting down the top with a piece of MDF or something. Yeah. It keeps it more stable. Um, I think the reason why I always stickered it was because the worst case scenario is if you just had a board and it was just like laying down on a bench top by itself oh, yeah. and then that one surface you know that's always going to move so the idea of stickering is always keeping air around not so much to make it move but just to sort of not have create any to have one side that moisture yeah. faces uh -huh. so it's like yeah if you're going to go flat you have to commit to it and make sure all those surfaces are oh, covered yeah. up yeah. yeah i mean the last yeah and even when you're stickering and that's something a lot of people don't do when you're stickering something the top board in the pile, you put stickers across that and you put a piece of plywood across that. Oh, there you go. So <clears> that <throat> now that even that top board has the same, you know, half inch of airspace as everything else in mm. the pile rather than having, you know, just being hanging out there to the end of the wind. You should start a school. Nah, that'd be crazy. It's too much work. <laughs> <laughs> You get there's people so asking much, you questions all so the time. Much more, yeah. <laughs> God. There's so much more to all of this than you think, but it's so much simpler sometimes, That's what's too. cool is there's so much that you, you know, years ago I used to think I knew what I was doing. Yeah. Nah, not even <laughs> close because you just find out how much you don't know. Yeah. yeah. And it's humbling. It really is. That's like my daily nine-to-five job. <laughs> like you sit down and you're like, no, you don't know anything. Yep, I know. Yeah. I'm used to it at least now. That's <clears throat> what happened. Yeah. I mean, that's how, when I got into period furniture, it was like, oh, God. You know, I had no idea all of this stuff even existed, let alone knew anything about it. Yeah. And now I have to learn all of that. It's like when Mike Maselli did the, his first uh, upholstery class uh -huh. at the school. He did this two-hour PowerPoint about history and technique and everything. I looked at him when it was done and said, thanks a lot. <laughs> and he goes, what? Didn't you like that? And I said, I was fine with upholstery being just something soft and squishy that you sat on. Now it's this huge, huge subject, subject that I knew nothing about. Now I know even less than I did before. <laughs> Uh, all right, so let's uh, let's hit our all-time favorite technique of all time for this week. I think you should start, Bob. Um, you got off easy last time. That was, you know, it was funny because I was thinking about that and I was like, okay, what are good? You know, what's a? You know, what do I really like to do? Uh, and just for the record, I mean, all of ours throughout the history of the show have just been recycled Bob Van Dyke techniques. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is just stuff that I've recycled from Steve Lotto, okay. Will Neptune, <laughs> Phil Lowe, anyone else, yeah. you know, like, yeah. Oh, no, these are ones that I all, I thought of every one of them. <laughs> yeah. 
So the two, I you know, I started to think about it and, you know, like in general, like what I love to do and love to make is like federal style bandings, um, decorative bandings, just because they are so counterintuitive. They hurt your mind trying to figure out how to do it. Yeah. You know, it's just like, oh, God. Make you these know. blocks, cut them at an angle, glue them back together, cut them at an angle. Sand shade them then. <laughs> yeah. And, then, and it's just like it's nuts. The the your, the reverse engineering that you have to do yeah. is crazy. Um, but what I, you know, the answer to the question is actually was not the federal style bandings because that was just really a big huge subject what i really like and i think about it you know last year at fine woodworking live i was doing the the fixing mistakes and that's a kick when mm -hmm. you can fix mistakes and make it so that it completely goes away and the what i really like to do is you know i was thinking that um tool chest that i uh that I was doing earlier this summer with you. Yes. And I screwed up that drawer, uh, put the, the lock mortise on the wrong edge, like an idiot. Um, and Wait, what edge could you put it on? On the front edge? I put it on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you get everyone think, oh, I love to see Bob make mistakes. <laughs> so just, <laughs> just hang around class. here for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't take well. You you can hold your breath. <laughs> but um, what what I and I played with it, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to fix this so you can't see it. And it's all about the grain. Everything when you're fixing mistakes, it's all about the grain. And this was in, um, I think, the drawer front. Yeah, it was quarter sawn white oak. So, okay, you got nice straight grain already. So you can do glue on anything and you're not going to see it. But you go around the corner and you look at the end grain. And the end grain, uh, if you can disguise that. Yeah. And that's what I did. And I took this piece and... Um, matched up the end grain. So I had to plane a bevel in the piece that I was going to glue up, and I'm looking at it, looking at the the um, the medullary rays, and are they all going the same direction? And is this the, the curvature of the pores? Is that going the same direction as the other stuff? And I spent a ridiculous amount of time uh, doing it, but just because I wanted to. And it's one of those... Okay, you glue it on, and you cannot see where it was glued on, you know, unless you look inside where I didn't finish uh, <laughs> doing where, where I screwed up the uh, mortise. But so I the, decided the to go to the outside part, you cannot see at all, even if you're looking at the end grain, and that's the kicker is the end grain. So, yeah. so, so matching the grain yeah. perfectly on a mistake, but taking it, the time to, to study yeah. all the faces. And not just the face, but the end grain yeah. also, because that's the tough one. That's the hard one to, to do. That's a problem with something like that. If you do it perfectly, you can't even see it. It's <laughs> right. like it's this, you can't brag about yeah, it. it's this absence <laughs> of like positive feedback. So if you show someone, it takes 15 minutes to explain what they can't see and why they don't see it. So, exactly. Yeah, That's yeah. the inverse of calling out your mistakes to someone yeah. in a piece of furniture. Which is the difference between a professional and an amateur woodworker. Yes. You know, the, the, the amateur, if, if you tell someone, wow, that's really a nice table that you made there. I really like it. And the amateur goes, yeah, but I messed up this. And you see how I screwed up the mortise there? And there's a scratch here, and I screwed up the finish and all. And you go, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. And you tell that a professional, you go, ah, the table is really nice. I liked what you did. And the guy goes, yep, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go next. Go next, Ben. All right. <clears throat> My all-time favorite technique of all time for this week involves moving a table saw. And it turns out my parents listen to the podcast, which is interesting. But the more interesting subnote of that is my mom, just so that everyone knows, my mom watches every video 
that comes out on findwoodworking.com. That's awesome. To the point where the other day she goes, so I was watching Matt Wade's joiner setup video, and it was really interesting how the elevator screws on the <laughs> <laughs> That's are, are reverse threaded. I was like, what is wrong with you? She wouldn't, <laughs> like, you know, six months ago, she would have no idea what a joiner is, let alone where it should be. And now she's talking about the reverse thread on elevator screws on a Powermatic joiner. So, side note there, yeah. But um, my father and I were moving um, Mike's old table saw, my new table saw, into my shop. And we were storing it uh, at the fine woodworking shop down the road. And... We had used it at a fine woodworking live or something, and it wound up going back there, and it was finally time to bring it to my shop. So we used the loading dock area. We just shimmy it in, into the back of his pickup truck and uh, along with a jointer, and we get to my house, and we put his old rickety ramps on the back of his pickup truck, and it turns out my father's been using the same wooden ramps for 40 years. And I put them together, and I screw a batten on the bottom to keep them from separating, and I start shimmying the table saw down, and one of these ramps, which turns out has always been significantly lighter than the other ramp. <laughs> <laughs> and every time we pick them up, we go, oh, this one's the heavy one. Well, the, the lighter one turns out has a little bit more flex to it. <laughs> And I'm shimmying the table saw down. My my dad's got his foot holding the, the ramp from pulling away. And all of a sudden, that right ramp starts to flex. Oh, uh, no. And the left ramp doesn't. Hey. And this table saw starts tipping away. And I'm screaming and cursing. And <laughs> I, I'm saying all sorts of stuff. And finally, my dad grabs the top of it. And we, we get it down. And then I look at this big 8-inch joiner on the back of his pickup truck. And I look at these ramps. Mm -hmm. And I go... Joiner lives there now. You'll just have to come over every time I need to join something because that's where the joiner lives. It's not getting off the truck. This is the reality. And my dad goes, well, just take that saw bench and stick it under the ramps. There and you go. It was as simple as, and it's, it's stupid, but it's going to help somebody out there. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But it is as simple as taking a saw bench that I had lying around and sticking it under the ramp and that's that makes the whole the whole mechanism solid as can be. A saw bench like a like a hand saw. Yeah. Hand saw bench. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And just stuck under there. I drove a couple screws through the ramp into the saw bench just uh -huh. to make sure it didn't move. Solid as can be. Took the joiner off, no problem, which weighed probably twice as much as the table saw. Yeah. And it was just one of those like, you know, those moments where your dad just says something and you you you're starting to feel confident in your knowledge base and your experience level in the world and everything. And you're, you struggle and almost throw a table saw on the floor and, you know, and he just goes, why don't you just put that under there? It's as simple as that. That's my all time favorite technique of all time for possibly ever. It's amazing Listen. how dads get smarter. The older <laughs> you get. <laughs> my father was dumb as a post until I was about 25 years old. And all of a sudden he got a brain, <laughs> you know, it was incredible. <laughs> so your technique is listen to your pop. Yeah. yeah. There you okay. go. Listen That's to your good. pop. If something's got too much flex into it, stick something under it as there opposed to just yeah. hope for the best. Yeah. It reminds me of this when the the guy that I started the school with years ago, we he had just gotten a brand new Delta radial arm saw. I think it was a twelve inch. It was really really nice radial arm saw. And Those words rarely go together. Yeah, I know. And <laughs> but I had used this one. It was incredible how accurate it was and how good it was. And it was on the, he had a pickup truck and we were going to put it in his basement. He's got this pickup truck with a bed liner. Um, and he, it was on the open tailgate. And he just had to move the truck about two feet. And he did it real gently. And as soon as he put it in gear, that saw went shoop right off the back. Bounced off the uh, bounced off the the driveway, and it never went into the shop. It went directly <laughs> back onto his saw to go down to get fixed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
gravity. Yeah, I, I was, I was, that, that table saw was coming away, and it was everything I could do to keep oh, it God. from falling. Yeah. And I was thinking, like, not only is this, like, my table saw, but I'll never hear the end of it from <laughs> Mike. <laughs> this is Mike's old table saw. So. Yeah. What you got, Mike? Uh, um... <clears throat> Nothing as good as those. <laughs> um, as I alluded to earlier, um, the technique is when I'm building like a case um, with a bunch of interior dividers or drawers and such, rather than trying to work those dividers into the initial construction, I'll just build the case and basically create a mitered liner with the various partitions that I need sort of attached with a, what's that called? A bird's mouth joint? The little, yeah, bird's the, the, yeah. Um, that V, the V. So yeah. it's basically, I'm, I'm sort of making a, a mitered box ish type of thing. And then that slides into the, um, interior as a single unit. Um, and again, it lets you work really, really thin and keep your, your, the dimensions of the stock really light. Um, and it lets you sort of not have to worry about exactly how you want to partition things as you're building and gluing up the case. And that's pretty much a trick from, I think like a traditional spice boxes are the in, internals are divided that way. I don't think there's the the liner that fits in. No, but but they're done the same way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and I think I, I picked up that technique from a spice box article that Steve Latta mm-hmm. did, you know, ten or fifteen mm-hmm. years back. That the whole bird's mouth joint, which is which is really nice and and very simple to yeah. do. Mm-hmm. Fussy, but but simple. Yeah. Can it be fussy and simple at the same time? Well, it's simple, but, you know, I mean, lots of stuff is, you know, Like a miter joint is the simplest joint, but it's really fussy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, good point. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you have to, you have to, if you have the, like it's done with a, with a router, a router table and, you know, dial it in perfectly and it's, you can make a hundred of them. Right. You know, dial it in a little bit, something other than that, and you got a whole bunch of scrap. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so that's good though i like the way now people will know exactly when we're recording this live podcast um because um just look on mike's instagram post from yesterday because <laughs> i'm pretty sure it was the same thing yes, yes. <laughs> getting well, double duty yesterday. i like that yes yeah. <laughs> yes that was a good post i think i liked it yeah all right. <clears throat> you didn't yeah. comment. I never comment. Well, no. The comments. Are, oh, Mike, that's so oh, beautiful. beautiful. Oh, that's <laughs> so. Shot. I love your work. Oh. I know, no, 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 no. Swoon. I love your book. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Can I have a sticker? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about glue up thing strategies. That was a really bad transition there. Yeah, that was terrible. All of you, our listeners, have different skill levels, woodworking interests, design aesthetics, makers you admire, workshops, tools, and projects unique to you. The aspects that join this community together are a shared love of the craft, the smell of the workshop, the challenge of perfection, and the chance to create something beautiful. That's why we introduced Fine Woodworking Unlimited, our new membership that gives you access to over 43 years of our content designed to help teach, inspire, and connect with you. Unlimited members have access to everything Fine Woodworking, including our complete online archive, over 55 video workshops, and our iconic magazine delivered right to your door. No matter where you are on your journey today, Unlimited has something to inspire your next step. To learn more, go to finewoodworking.com unlimited. All right, question number three. from Again, another map. Uh, I see many of the world's best woodworkers only apply glue to one mating surface of a joint, not both, as advocated by Hoadley of fine woodworking fame. When is it acceptable to apply glue to one surface of a mating joint? I'll address this first okay. because you're going to have a different answer. Yeah. Which is, and it's a really cool answer. Well, it's because you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um,. Well, the difference between glue on one surface for two surfaces for me has to do with um, is it a type of joint which um, can be clamped 
together in such a way that you're increasing the um, amount of pressure on the glue surfaces. That sounds somewhat obvious, but if you think of a panel glue up edge to edge, you put a clamp on there, uh, the more clamps you put on or the, or the more you tighten them, the more pressure you're putting on that joint. Um, the other type of joint would be like a mortise and tenon joint. You can clamp that together. All you're doing is keeping that shoulder seated to the opposing piece, but you're not adding clamping pressure to the mortise and tenon. You're relying on the fit of that joint. So whenever I can't get those two joints to come together with a clamp, like a mortise and tenon joint, I will glue both faces. Um, where I can get some clamping pressure on there, like a panel glue up, I prefer to glue just one of the two edges um, for two reasons. One is that you have a certain amount of working time with the glue before it starts to skin over and compromise the glue joint once you get clamps on there. So if I'm gluing every single surface, I'm going to tend to put a thinner coat of glue on each surface, which the thinner coat is going to have a chance to skin over a little bit faster than a thicker coat. And secondly, I'm applying glue to twice as many surfaces, so it takes me twice as long to apply that glue. Uh, conversely, if I put one heavier coat on a single face of that glue up, I can do it twice as fast, and that heavier coat is not going to skin up as fast as a thinner coat. So in a nutshell, I do one surface because it's a lot faster, and that has its own benefits. You really have thought through that, though. Well, because I know Bob has a really good answer for why <laughs> and, you do two surfaces. And, it's, and, it's, and, and, you know, what you said makes total sense. The thing, and it's, uh, part of it is that skinning over thing. Um, and, like, if I'm putting, uh, doing an edge joint, you know, a panel or something, I'm going to take the glue and I will, you know, it's in a bottle, in a glue bottle, uh, and I'm going to put a bead down both surfaces, both edges, and I'm going to put a bead down the middle, okay? And while it's a bead, I have time. Okay, so because it's because there's not a lot of air surface to it, right? But then I take my finger and I quickly spread out that bead and distribute the glue evenly over both surfaces. And now I don't have a lot of time because now I have a thin layer of glue, like Mike was talking about. That if I hang out there, now it's going to it'll start to skin over and compromise the joint. So that's that's the the timing thing. Um, as far as I used to only put glue on one edge, okay, and then and I used to tell students, I said, yeah, you put it on one edge, you put the two together, you squish them together. Now you got it on both edges, and it always made sense. And a you know, aren't I smart? Um, well, but, you're as smart as Mike. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, then I took one apart once after about four or five minutes and it wasn't, you know, I hadn't set up yet that I, you know, after 15, 20 minutes, forget it, it's not coming apart. But after about four minutes, I popped it apart. I don't remember why. And there were all of these holidays, these, these dry spots on the part that I didn't glue that, you know, didn't squish on like I had been telling students all these years that was going to, right. and it didn't do that. And I was like, okay, that's why you put it on both. A thin layer on both gets you, there's no question about it, rather than how many little dry spots are there in there, and you'll never know until the joint fails. It probably won't fail because the yellow glue is, I mean, a glue joint, is harder, is stronger. A good glue joint is stronger than the wood itself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got a little holiday here and there. It's probably not going to be a big deal. Right. But it's there. Right. And Holy knows what he's talking about. I mean, he's smart. <laughs> now that's a smart guy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Yes. He knows a lot about right. wood. Yeah. There's there's two totally different answers from two yeah. fairly unimpeachable woodworking authorities that contradict one another. Yeah, I can't. If you said one thing, I'd say okay. Bob says it. I'm gonna go for it. 
If you said one thing, answer. I, same thing. That's the, it. Must that's not what's matter. So great about woodworking. <laughs> Everybody's right. Oh yeah, I don't question Bob's yeah. technique whatsoever. Yeah. I have no arguments against it whatsoever. Exactly. I'm still glowing just one edge. Yeah. <laughs> so that means it's just yeah. the way today. Yeah. Right. But this is how I do it now. Yeah. 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 And so. I did it that I did it that way for years and years and years. Um, and it was just a couple of years ago, and I was like, oh, okay. Change my technique a little bit. It's a minor detail. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not the difference between you know make or break. Do you think that something like that matters more if, let's say, your um, edge jointing isn't very, very good? Um, I think the two layers would help, but, you know, get your edge jointing game where it needs to be. Yeah. Well, the thing is, that, and the thing is that, that, you know, glue, there's no, basically no tensile strength to it. So that whole, oh, it's going to fill the gaps right. type of thing, yeah. that's, that's a fallacy. I mean, the only place that I know of where that's actually legitimate is um, with epoxy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the whole, oh, you're, you're putting too much pressure on the joint. It's going to uh, starve the glue joint. Um, I had some of the people from Franklin at the school years ago uh, – type on manufacturers these are scientists and um they told him said now that that that's an old wives tale about you know starving the glue joint except with epoxy and epoxy i guess you can't do that evidently hmm. so cool all right question number four from anthony the last couple of years i've been on a hunt for an eight inch joiner and I just recently was able to secure a Craigslist purchase of a 12-inch joiner that I'm pretty excited about. It's Bridgewood 12-inch 5 horsepower that I picked up a few hours away from an, a now-retired door maker. As with most home woodworkers, my jointing experience has been on a 6-inch jointer. What are the potential areas of, con of concern with a larger jointer? In general, with a joiner, what leads up to an accident? Is it simply being unaware of your hands and proper use? Number one, put a guard on that joiner. Look at that. Yeah, you're right. <clears throat> Let's assume yeah. there's a guard on there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Because to run stuff with no guard, you have to have a really, really, really good reason. Yes. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, I have done it. When your stock is a half inch wider than your joiner bed is, that's you're a really good reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's one scary. of those. You, it's scary. Yeah. You know, running that thing with that, you just look at that thing spinning around. And oh, go, okay, what yeah. what could happen? Yeah, twelve inches of joiner head. Yeah, Oof. but okay, so we got that yeah. out of the way. But the thing is, six inches, ten inches, sixteen inches. If it can cut a piece of wood, yeah. They're all wider the than your hand. <laughs> fingers are a piece of cake. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it has nothing at all to do with the power. You know, I mean, it can be a three-quarter horsepower motor. It can be a 16-quarter -hor horse, you know, motor. It's not going not gonna to be any different. Right. With a, um, with a larger joiner, wouldn't the, the head normally be, the, the, head, the, the head circumference be larger as well? And therefore, there'd be a larger mouth opening? Uh, it doesn't necessarily work that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah it depends. The beds can sort of come up pretty tight. Regardless. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because um, if you look at that picture, the way it comes, uh, it comes up. Um, you know, the 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 bed is following the curvature of the of the um, the head. Okay. The thing where it was where it was a problem was the those square right. head with the Babbitt bearing and the square head and all, those were finger eaters. Yeah, because your finger okay. can go in way far before it contacts yeah. the the cutter head itself. Okay. Whereas a round cutter head with the blades only sticking out maybe a sixteenth of an inch. Hopefully that's all you're gonna hit. But I mean they're spinning so fast that uh, there's no good outcome to Yeah. And you know, getting your fingers close to joint contact. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so your your level of awareness is the same at a six-inch joiner as it is a sixteen-inch joiner. 
It is for me. Totally. Yeah, that doesn't change. Yeah. Yeah. There's no because uh, it's already code red. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's there's no um like I know we've we've talked about before don't you know 12 inches is as short of a board as you'd want to send over a joiner or a planer does that rule apply for the size I mean there's like what I would do in my shop and what the setups we think are safe in the school those are kind of two different ish things yeah um, but even so some of the stuff it's it's not a I would I would do this myself but not do it in front of people mm -hmm. uh it might be a matter of degrees yeah you know like okay i'm going to tell a student no that thing is 12 inches and or it's it's 10 and a half inches it's not going over the joiner um i might do something myself that was nine and a half inches long right yeah um, as long as I'm going, okay, think what you're doing, make yeah. sure that you have a, a push pad and you have a good push pad and be aware of what you're doing because that's a, you know, would I do something like five inches long? No, of course not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's why you have a hand plane, but the, the push pad doing something like that. And then those push pads, um, what is a, the grout, mm -hmm. grout float, the grout yeah. floats yeah. are, Incredible. I mean, mm -hmm. I had those those other push pads that I've had in the school. I'm not sure why I haven't just thrown them yes, all out. Right. You the know. little this They're rectangular worth. plastic, the white plastic yeah. with that really hard rubber, yeah. and half of it is always peeled yeah. up. Yeah. They're worthless. Yeah. They're worthless. And the, these grout floats, the ones, there's a soft, squishy one, and it's amazing how good it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could, you could. It's it grips. It doesn't matter how smooth it is. It grips it incredibly well right yeah. and rule of thumb is um if the board wasn't there is there anything between your hands and the cutter head yeah so if you're if you have a push pad and the board's not there okay the push pad's going into the cutter head so um, i'm pretty aware anytime um there are times when my hand goes over the cutter if i'm edge jointing mm -hmm. a board um i'm sort of getting better at avoiding that, but I'm always really, really aware when my hand, even if I'm holding a push pad, when my hand is going over that cutter. Um, the the one thing that I do, it might be wrong, but the only joiner I've ever really worked on much at all is <laughs> that 16 inch joiner, the SEMI, and um, I will move the fence forward. And essentially turn it into a four a inch joiner. Sure, right. If I'm, yeah. if I'm, if all I need is four inches of that joiner, yeah. that's all I allow myself. Is that outside of the head? Those are where the really sharp blades are because everyone keeps it kicked all the way in. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's yeah. that too. But I don't know. It's just it's a mental thing where it's just I like I don't think that's about I've practice. Got, I've got less of the the blade available to right. to whatever. Um, so that that's one thing that that I do, and then yeah. I also I I the taller or the wider a piece gets, the longer it has to be for me. So if yeah. you're if you're edge jointing a twelve inch wide piece, it's got to be two foot long for me because I I did have a, a piece dive into the head one time, mm -hmm. and I had you know it was it was wide, but this this I E center of gravity or whatever was too high for it, and that was the only time I've ever. Had to do a, had to do a check, you know, mm -hmm. of of my underwear after after using the, the joiner. Mm -hmm. But um, I I try and keep pieces larger than they need to be. It's one of those things. If you're ever uncomfortable with it, that's why God invented hand planes. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, you know, if you're not uncomfortable, if you're not comfortable then just stop any any machine technique if you're not comfortable with it then stop and figure out why because it might be something oh good thing i didn't do that yeah yeah or it, and you know you can always try a dry run with no power mm -hmm. and go okay now this is doable without you know not a problem uh or you go yeah, do it a different way. Right. Plus, it's a great chance to get your camera angles right. 
huh? <laughs> But I, I have found that a lot of times I'll do something in the shop. And it's like, yeah, I get through it. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily run a class having yeah. do the same way. But when I really stop and break it down and think about it, okay, what's a good way for a class to do this process? Yeah. I end up doing it that way myself from that point, you know, because after actually thinking about because it. Because you've thought about it, you've yeah. analyzed it, and you've gone, this is a better way and a yes. safer way. Yes. Why Keep doing it the dumb, dangerous way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Episode title right there. <clears throat> All right. Let's uh, let's hit some listener comments on YouTube uh, on uh, Shop Talk Live one seventy three from David McClengahan. I could not figure out what this was referring to, but I, I got it. Go metric, young man. It's so much easier than a random Vic Teslin rules. Then great show. Vic Teslin wasn't on that show, and we didn't talk about metric at all, but I think I was complaining about 30 seconds of an inch on a combo square. Hmm. They're really little. And pointless and annoying. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far. I'd just go, <laughs> they're really little. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> well said, Bob. All right, and then on iTunes, a five-star review from Paint by Lumbers. Uh, I am a wood shop teacher and love listening on my commute. The show gets me going to share my wood geekery with my students. Thanks for sharing your mistakes and successes in such a fun way. I thought a podcast on woodworking would be done, but you have honed it in. <laughs> Ouch. Wow. Yikes. Keep it up. <laughs> All right. I have a I have a Instagram recommendation. All right. Sidecar Furniture. Oh, yeah. David Johnson. Yeah. Go follow him. That's no. a great feed. What's it called? Uh, it's he's in LA area, the West Coast guy. He does a lot of seat weaving, uh -huh. um, a lot of Danish cord and um, intricate weavings, and he's furniture res restoration as well. Yeah. Um, I think he's doing an article with us. I think so. I yeah. think Anissa's working on something. Yep. Yeah, just great feed, uh -huh. great pictures, interesting stuff. Um, Content you don't really see anywhere else. Yeah. So really cool stuff. CT dot, what's my Instagram? <laughs> CT Valley? I remember. <laughs> so, there's a good one. <laughs> Mike, you got anything? Not anymore. <laughs> Yeah, That's... go buy a uh, go out and buy a fresh bottle of glue. Nothing better than a fresh bottle of glue. You know yeah. what? I bought a fresh bottle of glue the other day because I've been using the leftovers at right. the shop, and a brand new bottle of glue. Damn, does that glue come out fast? Isn't that nice? <laughs> <laughs> I was gluing up a little tendon at home. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> go figure. <laughs> All right, that's all for this episode of Shop Talk Live. If you have questions you'd like us to answer on the show, send them into shoptalkatalk.com. If you're watching on YouTube, please click that thumbs up button. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening, and stick around for a remix, because Bob said dub it way too many times for that not to happen. <laughs> <laughs>